Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Jonathan R. Latham, Ph.D. He's co-founder and executive director of the Bioscience Resource Project and the editor of Independent Science News. Dr. Latham is also the director of the Poison Papers Project, which publicizes documents of the chemical industry and its regulators. Dr. Latham holds a master's degree in crop genetics and a Ph.D. in virology. He was subsequently a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Genetics, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's published scientific papers in disciplines as diverse as plant ecology, plant virology, genetics, and genetic engineering. Dr. Latham talks frequently at international events and scientific and regulatory conferences on the research conducted by the project. He's written for Truthout, MIT Technology Review, The Guardian, Resilience, and many other magazines and websites. So first, thank you for being on the program. Second, thank you for your work in the world. Hi there, Derek. Thanks to you, too. Um, today, I would like to talk about pesticides in the EU. So can you, can you say what's going on in the European Union regarding pesticides? Um, yeah, of course. So, so the, the article that we wrote that came to your attention, I think, is uh, basically about how the EU is watering down their uh, regulatory standards. So they're in the process of reformulation, uh, and they're basically taking on board a bunch of ideas uh, that originate with the chemical industry and the oil industry and so forth. And these in industries basically, you know, are – uh, they, they're unhappy with the fact that the EU has standards of uh, chemical risk assessment that stand some chance, at least, of protecting the public. So, so that's the, that's the the short of it. Which and the, the point, I mean, one would one one could be forgiven for being naive enough to think that perhaps the point of these regulations is to protect the public. Well, it, absolutely, it, it is. You know, in the minds of the public, at least, that's what they're there for. Uh, I think you could argue that in the minds of the uh, the chemical industry, what they're there for is to create a kind of smokescreen of, you know, the illusion of of uh, protection. What what they also exist for for the chemical industry is they feel like they are. They're barriers to the entry of little people sometimes, these regulations. And in the minds of uh, EU politicians, for example, they are, you know, sometimes a barrier to international trade. They have performed all kinds of roles. And, you know, what, only one of which is basically to protect the public. So before we talk about um, the the processes of testing, the processes the the, the seemingly go into this regulation. Can we mm. talk about the actual pesticides themselves for a minute? What what are we talking about? So we're we're talking about products that are sprayed on your food. So they will be uh herbicides, they will be uh insecticides, they will be fungicides. Some of them some in agriculture people are u using uh more and more antibiotics, for example, on fruits. Like fruits will have bacterial diseases and people are spraying actual uh, commercial antibiotics on peaches and things nowadays. So, so there's whole rafts of these chemicals that are being used. And one of the most important things for people to understand about them is that, you know, although they're called herbicides or although they're called rodenticides or the, although they're called fungicides, many of the, many of the most, uh, very often, those products kill much more than what's advertised on the label, right? And the question of how much more is what's really at stake here. You know, does a fungicide also kill frogs, for example? You know, some herbicides are more poisonous to, to frogs than what they are to, to herbs. And so, you know, these names, you have to kind of take them with a pinch of salt. They're invented by the chemical industry in the first place to create an illusion of protection and illusion of specificity. But th these are what we're talking about, is products used basically in agriculture. They're also used sometimes other places, like, for example, uh, many insecticides are used on clothing by the military or by, the, by uh, people who go out in, into the woods and who want to protect themselves against ticks or against mosquitoes. So they have, you know, they're, they're used primarily in agriculture, but then they're used in many, many other places too. You know, you mentioned um, antibiotics being sprayed on peaches, and I, I find it extraordinary 
first I found it extraordinary already when you can have on the same day you can read an article about how various medical people are concerned about antibiotic resistance and so individuals should be very careful about taking too many antibiotics and then on the same day you can read an article about antibiotics being used in mass feedlots mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. And now we find out that they're not only being used in feedlots, but they're being used on orchards. So this this seems. Well, I want to say one more story about this. It seems remarkably stupid. And then the other thing is, when I was nine weeks old, I developed what's called pyloric stenosis, which is the bottom of my stomach grew shut, and I had to go in and surgically open it. And for the longest time, I thought, oh, gosh, that just means that had I been born 5,000 years ago, I would have died. I thought it was just a genetic condition or something. Mm. But it mm. ends up, I, I finally looked it up, and it ends up that uh, one of the potential causes of pyloric stenosis is the mother ingesting antibiotics during her pregnancy. And I asked mm -hmm. my mom about that. My mom said, no, I didn't take any antibiotics during your pregnancy, and Let's let's presume that she was right, but it doesn't matter because at this I mean at this stage it wouldn't matter because she could have eaten some peaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm getting at? It's like yeah, yeah. If you can have people who, for whatever reason, should not under any circumstances be taking antibiotics, and now you eat some peach ice cream, and there you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really interesting that very little research is actually done on the health consequences of some products that we have been around for for decades and decades and decades. So so you know we don't know whether the long term consequences of eating antibiotics for example, you know we know we know that the bugs that live in your stomach are necessary for the production for the, your immune system to develop in the first place, right? But this is only something that's become apparent in the last few years. So we have, you know, a set of compounds that are considered to harm bacteria, but ultimately end up, what they end up doing is rebounding on, on our cells quite often. And, uh, you know, my, my gastroenterologist told me a year ago when I went to visit him, I'd never heard of this before, but evidently a lot of people are hearing about this, about the relationship between not just how we develop an immune system, like you said, and not just how we, um, how we, how we digest, but also that that flora through our gastrointestinal system uh, strongly affects cognitive function. And the point really is not yeah. to get yeah. into a detailed discussion of that, but the point is we have no idea, and it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. We're just messing around with things. We have no clue what they mean. Mm. Well, well, we will get into this, you know, I think, as we go through our pesticide discussion, because this is, you know, I think this is what you're getting into, really, is that, you know, we, we introduce pesticides into the food supply and into agricultural systems, and they get into the water supply, and they get into the aquifers and whatever, based on a tiny handful of tests, right? And these handful of tests have, you know, they tell you something very specific about the specific organisms that you, that you test them on under the particular diets that they ate and the particular strains that they were, but... You know, what they mean for the entire rest of the global ecosystem and so forth, this is basically unresearched, right? So our chemical, you know, we talked about this last time uh, when I talked about pesticides. You know, you can, you can basically consider all of these chemicals to be untested. You know, they've been tested on one species out of several billion that have been put onto the – that have been – you know, that exist in the wild. Or they've been tested on maybe three species out of a billion that have been – that they will ultimately be who a billion species that will ultimately be exposed. So yeah, we 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 know so little, and, and scientists, you know, are totally lacking in in humility in this uh, in in this scenario. So let's talk specifically about testing. How does that process work? Who's in charge? Just feel free to go on mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. the next part of the interview about that testing process. Yeah. So we have, uh, you know, in the in the in the U.S., for example, there is there is a system nominally of testing pesticides, at least. You know, for many products, there's no there's no actual testing system. In the case of pesticides, there is a testing system, 
because these are things deliberately introduced into the food supply and they're deliberately intended to kill things for the most part. And so there is a superficial rationale for, uh, you know, even the chemical industry accepts that, that these products need to be tested uh, and otherwise they're not safe. So what is, what is uh, essentially the reality of that testing system, though, is the big problematic issue here. And what we've been arguing for quite a while now is that you have uh, a system that is unable to actually protect the public. And the reason why it's unable to take, protect the public is that you have uh, tests that are being done on rats or on mice or on dogs or different species. And, you know, if you look into the details of what happens when you test substances on, on rats versus mice versus dogs versus horses, you always get different results, right? And the testing system is predicated on that not being the case, right? That, that when you test something on mice or on rats or on dogs, that those that, that gives you a reasonable indication of what will happen in humans. And that's basically, you know, there's practically no evidence for that being true. Occasionally, sometimes it is true, right? Maybe 50% of the time it's true that these substances have a similar or related effects on, uh, on humans. But half the time it's not true, right? And so our basic, basic premise, of the testing system is essentially false. And so you have a bunch of institutions who are trying to kind of look the other way, right? They're trying to basically pretend that what they're doing is rigorous testing and they're going through all these sort of pseudo rational uh, procedures to try to like flesh this out, you know, in some cases to make it, you know, to create more of an illusion of safety and on the other hand, you've got the chemical industry, for example, which is trying to even take this system and break it down into a, into a system that allows their products to get through more easily. So what they're doing is they're doing things like, for example, uh, if you do a, an animal experiment, you test, say, 100 rats. Uh, with a herbicide. You've got a new herbicide. You give it to 100 rats. You have a control set of animals, and you don't give them the herbicide. What the chemical industry, you know, observes, and everybody who does these tests tends to observe, is that you often will get an excess of cancers or some kind of chronic disease will develop in the treated animals. This is a very common outcome. And what the question then becomes, what is the meaning of that excessive disease or excessive of cancers or excessive of lumps or whatever, whatever, they, whatever, whatever it is that's different about the treated group? And the chemical industry is basically trying, you know, they want to argue that when you don't see an effect, which sometimes is true, that that guarantees that their product is safe. But what they also want to do is introduced into the minds of the regulators the idea that even if you do see an excess of tumors or an excess of, of one particular set of illnesses, that these are not necessarily uh, indicators of human harm. So essentially what they're doing is they're introducing a double standard. Right? What they want to argue is if it shows it's safe, it's safe, and if it shows it's harmful, it might still be safe. And so, so this, is, this is something that uh, is being fought over in the European Union at the moment. You know, many of these issues have been, just, have been basically won by the chemical industry in the case of the U.S., but in the European Union, they're still up for grabs. And so one of the subjects of the article that we, we wrote is basically how the chemical industry is trying to get regulators to question what they call the human relevance of tumors and evidence of gen genetic damage that exists in mice and other test animals when they observe it. So this is one thing that's being fought over. Another thing that's being fought over is, that, is the idea that there are toxicological thresholds, right? that you can be exposed to certain amounts of Roundup or atrazine or, or uh, aldicarb or you know, these, all, any, any particular chemical below which there is no possibility that you will be harmed, right? So, you know, on the one hand, you've got 
regulators saying they like to see a dose response curve and there's a linear relationship between how much you're exposed to and the harm that will result from these chemicals and they're trying to basically throw out if, if anybody ever finds something that doesn't correspond to what they call a dose response curve so when you when you administer more uh, of the test substance that the more you add the more disease you should see and if you don't see a clear relationship between those two things what the chemical industry wants the regulators to do is throw out that evidence right because it's another basically it's a what they're introducing is another barrier to the conclusion that you will that that uh, this is a carcinogen or this causes cancer or this causes genetic damage so so this is the human re relevance idea is basically another way to basically prevent regulators from make, drawing conclusions about differences in treated groups. They have another system, for example, where they want to Im imagine that you feed animals a pesticide, and that pesticide breaks down inside the body of the animal. When the pesticide, sometimes, with many pesticides, it's actually the breakdown products that cause the harm. Right? The initial pesticide doesn't appear to be that dangerous, but it breaks down into products that actually are dangerous. And so, so those chemicals, it's sort of generally understood that those chemicals, those breakdown products need also to be tested at some level. What the chemical industry is trying to do is set thresholds around those breakdown products to make sure that the, when regulators look at those breakdown products, they don't look very carefully that they don't worry about certain concentrations of those uh, breakdown products. And that, so essentially what they're doing is creating all these uh, situations which normally arise in the scientific assessment of all these chemicals in such a way that, that when regulators come to look at them, they've kind of half made up their minds that these are issues that are not important. Right? So you, they're trying to discard the effects of different metabolites, they're trying to discard effects that arise in, say, organs. So the, the classic example here is rats have a thing called a foregut, and humans don't have a, what we call a foregut. So what the, what the chemical industry would like the regulators to do is if, they, if a regulator ever sees or a chemical test shows a cancer, for example, developed in the foregut of a mouse, that that is automatically discounted as being of human relevance because humans don't have a foregut. But what, you know, there's a double standard once again because uh, rats also fail to have organs that humans have. So rats are not even testing for, rats don't have gallbladders, for example. So your gallbladder, according to this standard, your gallbladder is never suspected, is never tested for. Right? If, if, the, if the testing system relies on testing rats, you, rats don't have a gallbladder. You're, you're basically, your gallbladder is not included in the regulatory system. Right? So, but, the, the, but what the chemical industry wants to do is have the regulators throw out results that are involved in that, that where basically the rat has an organ that the human doesn't, doesn't have, but then ignore the results the, which are the other way around, where the rat doesn't have a gallbladder, therefore your gallbladder isn't tethered. They want them to ignore that too. Right? So they're playing these little games with the regulators, trying to introduce these little understandings into the legal regulations so that when the European Union basically says, we do our testing according to strict scientific standards, the scientific standard doesn't include the fact that rats don't have a gallbladder or that they're not counting certain types of cancers that appear in rats. So, so these are the kind of examples of changes that the chemical industry is trying to introduce. And what they're doing is trying to get scientists who are friendly with them to basically work for them, to basically introduce these changes into the chemical regulations so that nobody can say, well, this idea came from Monsanto and this idea came from Bayer and this idea came from Syngenta and all these other companies who, where, where these ideas really do come from. But, but it looks to the, to the politicians and to the public 
that this is merely a scientific change. It's based on logic and that, that essentially they're still being protected, but what's happening is we're avoiding the finding false positive results and basically throwing out pesticides that shouldn't be that, that should, should be allowed on the market but have been basically rejected for no good reason. Whereas the reality of the chemical testing system is that it is essentially ignoring harm. Right? And what they're trying to do is get, the, get a chemical safety system that essentially looks like science, but is really pseudoscience, right? because it's basically ignoring all these, basically arbitrarily ignoring all these evidences of harm. Does, it, does that make a certain amount of sense? I've been a little long-winded in my explanation, but, but there are all these different aspects to the regulatory system, the metabolites, how you interpret animal data, how you interpret the meaning of certain uh, certain exposures, how you interpret the meaning of certain thresholds, how you interpret the meaning of the metabolites, and and so on and so forth. So there's a whole kind of uh, raft of these changes that are being introduced into the European Union regulatory system, which at the moment is basically the best that exists anywhere. So one of, one of the, a couple of things I hear you saying are that they will argue that testing on testing a certain substance on rats is will tell people whether that substance is safe in humans but then if it is shown to be unsafe in rats then they will argue quite possibly argue that uh, the test showing it's unsafe for rats does not imply that it's unsafe for humans Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, that, that seems to be a pretty clear example of, of showing that, I mean, that, that seems to be pretty transparent what they're trying to do. It's a very obvious double standard, right? Does it, isn't, that, isn't that how it seems to you? I mean, basically, yeah, I think, yeah. you're, you're saying the, the, the standard for approval and the standard for disapproval are completely different. And one is a high bar and one is a low bar. And basically, this is protecting the chemical industry, and it's not protecting you. Yeah. Well, it's it's, you know, years and years ago, I was talking with a friend who does a lot of work on the precautionary principle, and she, where I came down on that is that there is sort of a precautionary principle already in place, but the precautionary principle um, protects not living beings but instead profits that basically something mm -hmm. has to mm -hmm. be uh, do you want to talk about the precautionary principle for a moment I mean the, the precautionary principle sure the precautionary principle is something that you use in your everyday life right you take out health insurance because you might get sick you take out car insurance because you might crush your car you take out you know you look before you cross the road it's a very very simple principle and it's often sort of dressed up in this complicated language in order to make it you know seem legalistic and in, in, in order for it to be enshrined in various legal places and for the UN to talk about it but it is really as simple as that and these these uh, you know industry executives who claim to hate it so much use it all the time in their business decisions right they don't want to be blindsided by you know, a consumer revolt or, a, or a, some kind of unexpected safety hazard issue or by, uh, you know, an approval decision going against them or the stock exchange going up or the stock exchange going down. They use the precautionary principle all the time. But what they don't want people to do is use it, as you say, against them, right? Because we have to be protected against them. We can be blindsided by Monsanto's new product or Bayer's new product or, or so on and so forth, right? And these companies have a, a, a you know, proven track record of harming people in order to make profit. So, you know, when anybody argues that the precautionary principle is some kind of ridiculous thing that's dreamed up by environmental, wacky environmentalists and so on and so forth, this is mind-bogglingly, mind-boggling misunderstanding of what is going on and and your interpretation of saying that you know this is something that is used to protect 
corporations is exactly true, right? This whole regulatory system is basically is basically designed around the precautionary principle, but backwards. Yeah, so it's protecting corporations and not people. Um, sorry about that in the background. That is uh, the dogs protecting this place from an airplane flying over. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so just a second. You know, we're talking about the precautionary influence, and we're talking about uh, the the chemical companies saying that, you know, if you test it on a rat, that on one level means that it's safe on humans. On another level, it, if it, something happens to a rat, that doesn't mean it will affect humans. But what, as you said early on in the interview, is left untested are the other three billion creatures. I mean, if you have an anti... I, I go back to the example I used early on. If you have a mother taking an antibiotic or eating a chicken that has antibiotics in it, mm -hmm. and then that leading to the child's, the infant's stomach growing shut, the mm -hmm. world is a complex place where mm -hmm. you can have um, Roundup break down into components that then cause serious endocrine problems in frogs. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, the thing that blows me there, away. There are endless us, possibilities, right? Yep. Exactly. And these are just huge open air experiments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you have, you know, the way the way that a rational person should think about this is that they're basically not protected. But not only are they not protected, the the rest of the planet is not protected either. You know, and they're very simple. They're very simple. You know, uh, uh, cause and effects that people even don't think about. You know, for example, when people put a pesticide onto their clothes. You know, you buy a piece of clothing that's anti-tick from L.L. Bean, and then you put it in your washing machine, and you wash it, then what happens to that pesticide, right? It's basically, a, uh, a, you know, it will basically come off on your clothing, either because the, the lint comes off or because the thing dissolves in the water, and that ends up in your nearest river, right, and in your septic tank and in your in the sewage sludge that then is put on the field, right? For the most part, it doesn't break down. It just goes into those places. But that means that L.L. Bean is now the source of massive amounts of a pesticide entering the rivers and the lakes. So, so these are very simple things. But what that means is you then have an exposure, right? Your whole lake, you know, you're the lake that's 10 miles down, down your river or the dammed, dammed, uh, the Dan River, you know, wherever that, that effluent shows up is basically continuously exposed to a pesticide uh, that, uh, that is being generated by every single household in that, in that watershed, basically. And so, we have absolutely yeah. – sorry, go ahead. So, so, you know, these are simple cause and, cause and effect uh, chains that most people spend zero time thinking about. But, but you have to understand that your chemical regulators are spending zero time thinking about these cause and events too. Because if they did think about them, they wouldn't be doing this in the first place. Right? They, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow these products out into the market. Because, of course, they're going to cause massive harm. And so, so you, have, you, know, you have all the aquatic life. You've got all the bird life. You've got all the fish life. You've got all the plants are potentially at risk from this substance that, that, that washed off your clothes and you put into the into the laundry. But hey, at least I don't have to pull ticks off my socks. That's that's right. You have to bend down. Yep, yep. And so we've in in the article, um and we haven't talked about them specifically, but mm. can you talk for a moment about the uh uh, what are they called? The the neocotinoids? Is that how you pronounce it? Neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Yeah. Um, yeah. They seem like a a particularly uh, a particularly bad thing. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm well, they they are. You know, I mean, it's a, open to doubt whether they're worse than the pre-existing compound what is interesting about them is 
implies they're water soluble. So, so you know, the previous generations of pesticides were not very water soluble. So, you know, if you sprayed them in the, your garden, they would more or less stay there. If you, uh, you know, if you put them on food, they would more or less stay there. And this is a problem in the sense that these compounds would bioaccumulate, right? Basically, you've got two choices with a substance. If a substance doesn't break down, if a substance breaks down, then, then you know, all bets are off. It potentially, is a reasonably safe pesticide. But if it doesn't break down, there are two choices. It can be fat-soluble. If it's fat-soluble, it basically doesn't move anywhere, but it will bioaccumulate. So if you spray it in your garden, on your vegetable patch, and then some uh, spider eats the aphid that you are trying to kill, it will accumulate some of that pesticide. Then the bird that eats the spider will accumulate uh, that pesticide. And basically it will eat 10 spiders a day, so it will get 10 spiders worth of pesticide every single day. Then that, then the the bird of prey that comes along and eats that bird in turn, that will get, uh, you know, hundreds of spiders worth of pesticide every single time it eats, uh, you know, a sparrow or a, or a blue jay or whatever it is that it eats. So basically, these these fat soluble substances they accumulate in the food chain, and they're broken down at a slow rate usually uh, by the body itself, like the liver will detoxify these things. The liver will, the kidney will will detoxify a little bit. So there is a certain breakdown rate, but often it's not quick enough to protect the birds of prey, for example. So we have this whole generation of pesticides that were accumulating in the food chain and that end up harming the the top predators, right? The condors and the the uh, and the the birds of prey. But neonicotinoids have the opposite problem, that they're water-soluble. So you put them, you spray them onto your, uh, you put, what they want to do locally around here is put them into hemlocks, right? Basically to kill woolly edelgids that are invasive insects. So what's, what, you know, local uh, nature reserves and so on and so forth are doing is they're injecting these neonicotinoids into the tree so you can, because it's water soluble, you can inject it into the tree. It goes all the way, it spreads all the way through the tree, down out into every single leaf, and it sits there and it kills these woolly edelgids. That part is not the problem, but what happens is uh, the leaves drop and the roots decay, and the tree falls over. You know, eventually the tree will die. Basically, those neonicotinoids get out into the environment when the leaves drop. They are eaten by earthworms, they're eaten by arthropods, they're eaten by uh, all the little beetles and so forth. But they, are, they will be exposed to the neonicotinoids that are supposed to kill insects. And so they do, right? And so they're basically, as soon as the leaves drop, then they will be exposed. Then those leaves will, will end up in the streams. They will end up in the water supply. They will end up in all these places that where they will continually poison the insects, and then it will end up in the lake, right? So basically the leaves blow into the river eventually, or they break down, and the soluble substance breaks down and goes into the river. So everything ends up in the water, right? Because it's water-soluble. It's not going into the fat. It's not going to fatty substances. The fatty substances are basically living organisms, and water-soluble things are basically the rivers, the lakes, the aquifers, and so forth. So these neonicotinoids are going into all those areas and poisoning all the insects, plus, you know, a whole bunch of other side effects too, right? So somebody exposed deer. The other a new scientific paper came out exposing deer to neonicotinoids leaves, uh, gives rise to all kinds of bad effects, right? So, so you know, the, these neonicotinoids will end up in your water supply, for example, in a way that DDT did not, in a way that, that, you know, all these old insecticides, toxaphene and so on and so forth, they did not end up in the, in the water supply, but neonicotinoids are. And, of course, water is life, pretty much, right? So, so it's ending up in, these, uh, in all the organisms, and they are broad-spectrum insecticides. And as I said, you know, they kill other organisms too. 
you know, probably at a at a lower rate, but they still have their their bad effects. And the biological half life of these things is is at least months, right? So six months or so. So if you put it into a tree, if you inject this substance into a tree, and you try to save your ash tree or your hemlock or whatever, that stuff will still be around 10 or 20 years from now, because the half life is six months or a year. And so, and we don't even, you know, people don't even bother to measure what is the half life in these trees. It may even be longer than that. We we don't know. The half life measurements are done by companies, and you don't have to believe them if you don't want to. But so so, but basically, you know, assuming these companies are correct, the half life is six months. That means that after 10 years, there's still about 10% of it left. Five or 10% will be left. So so basically, they're long lasting substances in the environment that are getting into the, all the water and the water supplies and so forth. But that leads to a wholly different and unfamiliar set of hazards to the ones that we're used to. You know, we're used to, to fat-soluble compounds bioaccumulating in killer whales and in seals and in, in uh, higher predators, whereas these neonicotinoids are being used even vaster quantities than DDT was used and being basically spreading into totally different ecosystems. But we're not prepared for that in in risk assessment terms, right? So, you know, our whole risk assessment was designed around these insoluble compounds, and now we've got all these soluble compounds that are being created by the pesticide companies that the regulators are not ready for. And, you know, they're not anticipating these things. They're not thinking too hard about what it is they're doing. They're just rubber stamping, in the most part, uh, these new substances. Well, this is one of the things that makes me really... um upset is all of these open air experiments when we consider ourselves to be so smart and there's there's one sentence I'm fixating on for a moment where you said the lot of them they don't even know the half life mm-hmm. and we know this for you know just all sorts of chemicals that there's this huge backlog that even under the sort of rudimentary testing that you're talking about there's this huge backlog of chemicals that haven't even been tested and mm-hmm. I don't, I don't understand how we can consider ourselves so smart as a species, and so smart as a culture, and yet we do these open air experiments. It just, I mean, did none of these people ever ever see the Sorcerer's Apprentice when they were kids? It's it's just, it is, it, it boggles my mind that chemicals are being released into the world when not only do they not know how toxic they may be to freshwater mussels, but they don't even know the Mm -hmm. Mm half-life. That just seems nuts to me. And I understand it's not nuts because it serves the interests of capital, because on the other hand, the, uh, the, the researchers, I'm sure if they were in on this conversation, they could say, look, you want us to figure out the half life. What if the half life is 50 years? We don't have the time because, because we need this product on the market today. Mhm mhm I mean the you know the the layers of of you know I like to call them sometimes like pseudoscience are incredibly deep you know we have these you know when i say we don't know the half life you know a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know somebody did an experiment once on a piece of on a water body or something you know they put it into a test tube and they measured how fast it disappeared but you know the the question the question for the half-life of that substance is is not, you know, what is the half-life in a glass of water? It's what is the half-life in the soil? What is the half-life in the river that it goes into? What is the half-life in the lake that it winds up in? What is the half-life in the tree that you inject it into? What is the half-life in the wheat plant that you spray it onto? Right. So these questions never get asked. Basically, you know, people do, you know, people, people faff around the edges of these questions. You know, they'll take some measurement and that will go down in the scientific literature. This is the half-life of this substance. But that basically, there are so many other questions that, that need to be asked about them. That, that basically, you know, people just look the other way as far as I can see. I mean, the, the conversations that need to be had around these issues are very interesting ones, right? You know, how can P 
people who call themselves scientists and the wisest in their society and so on and so forth be so stupid, right, as to make these decisions and to support these decisions. And part of it is that they have, you know, the chemical industry, you know, basically finances our universities and our media to create all these stories and narratives around, you know, firstly the wisdom of scientists how they're not affected by conflicts of interest, how science is so clever, how scientists are so objective, how scientists are so, uh, you know, have this long history of always, you know, uh, reflecting on their own, uh, on their own, you know, problematic things and how scientists are so humble and scientists are so, so, um, what's the right word, uh, you know, kind of disinterested. And yet they spend all their time bribing scientists effectively and giving them money to do research on their Lotus products and so on and so forth. So, like, you know, a lot of it is that scientists are inside these bubbles, you know, that you and I are not really inside. You know, we don't spend our whole life at Cornell University and Harvard University and University of Oregon or whatever, we don't spend our time inside these things, but inside these institutions is kind of like a there's a bubble of thought, you know, in which which just scientists just think completely differently. I mean, I was in a seminar the other. I'm going to write about this, but I was in a seminar the other day, and the professor offers pesticide to his students to eat. Right? I was completely stunned that anybody would do that. And yet he told them it was perfectly safe and that they shouldn't worry at all. And so so they, they three of them took it, right? And to me, this is just astounding. But, you know, in the seminar were other members of staff, right? Other faculty members, they thought it was hilarious that, he, that this, this professor was offering this pesticide, right? So this is, you know, this is the disconnect between the way you and I think and between uh, and how ma many, many members of the public think and how these professors inside their universities think. That is how big the gulf is. So we have about five or six minutes left and um, I guess I have three questions. One of them, and you can take any one, two or three mm. of them. One would be are there some things you want to talk about this general subject I haven't given you the opportunity? Another would be if they made you immediately the uh, the head of the uh, EU for all things testing on pesticide, mm -hmm. what would you do? Or the third would be if they made you the head of how we should discuss pesticides, how would you want us to discuss them? So take any one, two, or three of those. I don't care what. Mm. I mean, the, the, second, the second question interests me. You know, what would I do if I was the head of the European regulators or the EPA? And, and I think the very first thing I would do is make the, the, the scientists who make the regulatory decisions that our, policy, that our politicians and policymakers profess to rely on, make them responsible for the decisions that they make. Right, so they would be liable if people died, not the companies, right? Because because think about it, the people, the regulators, their job is to protect us. The company's job, you know, I think fairly in a way, is to make money and to make a product that people want. We shouldn't expect them to do that, do the testing, right? We shouldn't expect them to decide whether their own product is safe. I don't think we should expect them to be to be that. In, indifferent to their own, to the fate of their own product. The responsibility for the safety of these products rests with these scientists, right? The people in the universities, the people in the regulatory system, the people who oversee the regulatory system. When EPA has, makes a decision and they ask a panel of scientists to, to basically look it over before they promulgate it, you know, there, there is a degree of transparency there, right? These scientists have the power and the opportunity to basically say, no, we don't think this is safe. But the thing is, they're immune from responsibility, right? Because no one holds them accountable. 
everybody blames the companies. And I don't think that's the right place to put the blame. The blame, you know, if you want to, you know, I, I believe in systems that everybody's to blame, you know, including the indifference of the public to some extent. But but what is uh, what the people ultimately who who shoulder more should shoulder more of the blame than anyone else are the regulators whose legal duty it is to protect the public. So they should be held responsible, right? The scientists who oversee that should be held responsible. And I can guarantee you that that very few pesticides would actually pass through the system if you made if you made a law in which those people were made accountable. And uh, the other, um, the other, the the third question you asked is, how should we have these conversations? <clears throat> the the fundamental error that people mistake is that you they don't understand their relations to the natural world, right? That we think somehow that we are genetically distinct organisms, immune to the uh, to the effects of the world around us. We think we are, you know, thinking beings who have, you know, we have our own brilliant ideas and, and we communicate those to other people or we may learn about things from other people, but we don't really understand the kind of sea of ideas in which we're in and in that, uh, you know, we're not normally the originators of brilliant ideas. We just, we accumulate them from other people and we pass them on to other people, but we're part of an ecosystem of ideas. And the same is true for chemicals, right? Anything that you use as shampoo or anything that you rub on your skin or anything you eat is, has a distinct possibility of harming you and sometimes killing you. And people don't understand that. They think that they are individuals who are immune from all these things, that you're not what you eat, you're not what you put on your skin. People should think about every, you know, when, if you use a shampoo, you should think the question you should ask yourself first is, would I eat this shampoo? Right? If you put something, you know, if you put lipstick on, right, you should think, would I eat this lipstick? Because basically it ends up in you. Right? Whether you know understand that properly or not. The that is where it goes. And the average so people, woman sorry. The average woman eats about seven pounds of lipstick in her life. Hmm. Yeah. But they probably eat I mean, I'm not sure of how, how that figure is arrived at but but that that is you know this is fat soluble fat soluble substance right the the that may not even break down i don't even know what lipstick is made from i mean i use as few of these compounds as possible and i in our house we have you know as much as possible is made from wood or glass or metal or natural fabrics and you know we we try hard not to bring weird plastic things and weird substances and weird uh no scents and lotions and stuff into our house because because we treat them all as things that potentially could kill us and i think it's the additive burden you know i don't think it really comes down to specific chemicals that end up killing us it's the total burden of everything that we eat like you say you know that seven pounds of of lipstick is you know you probably eat uh the equivalent amount of glyphosate in your life. You probably eat the equivalent amount of a whole bunch of other pesticides and, and uh, formulants and things that go into making pesticides. You can multiply that. You know, your your body is full of hundreds of different chemicals made by Bayer or Monsanto and Syngenta and all these other companies, right? If you eat, you know, the standard American diet, the standard European diet, your your body is full of these things. And these are, you know, this is... These are, you know, and this is only a part of, of what you ingest because you're also breathing things in. There's all the, when you, when you smell weird smells in your car and in somebody's new home and in some, you know, you go to a, to a, to a lecture or something like that and there's, you know, there's been recently decorated, you're ingesting all these substances. And it, to me, it's no surprise that people become sick. You know, they, they get Parkinson's disease. That even though we have... You know, in some sense, it's a way better diet and more regular food, and we understand how to exercise better and so forth. The people's life expectancy isn't really going up, and in some cases, going down. And and the probability that this has, doesn't have to do with the chemicals that we ingest is basically zero, because we know that these things 
uh, affect rats. You know, we know that that humans get lead poisoning, that they get chlorpyrifos poisoning, that we all get all suffer from DDT poisoning, that we all suffer from dioxins and so forth. They say it's proven beyond any doubt, right? And then we've got all these substances, other substances that we've hardly even bothered to investigate that we're in, in, uh, introducing into our bodies without you know, without all that testing and basically just haven't come to the attention of the chemical, chemical, you know, activists, you know, uh, groups like or scientists or NGOs, simply because there's too many of them. So, so, you know, the situation is really, is really, really bad. And people need to understand that they, they need to work out how to protect themselves. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And thank you for your work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Jonathan Latham. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.